Hello and welcome to the second episode of Design Education Talks, uh, the collaboration between the team here of the New Art School and the Design Dedux podcast. Our guest today is Simon Dixon. Welcome, Simon. Good morning. Thanks. Can you tell us a bit about you and your work? Yeah, I run a, um, I'm a co-founder and I run a design practice in London called Dixon Baxi. We're just entering our 19th year and I have a business partner, Apova Baxi, and he and I have worked together for 25 years as designers. And basically we're a brand and design consultancy. So we build very large brand systems for international companies. About 80% of the work we do is international. So we brand build for people like Amazon and Audible, the Premier League, AC Milan, people like Fox. So we do a lot of um, very large audience work. Um, I'm trained as a graphic designer. So a lot of the work we do is based on the kind of fundamentals of graphic design, but we're very digital first as well. So a lot of it is applied through, you know, lots of platforms and devices. And, you know, in a sense, our job is to connect brands to people all over the world. Fantastic. Fantastic. So uh, you, you get to see uh, also a lot of students and yes. uh, that, that come in. So how do you, how do you find the, uh, the current level of, of graduates that are coming in through, through, through your door? It's, um, I guess if I was being really honest, it's the same every generation, is there's different levels of talent and enthusiasm for the industry. I think sometimes um, there's a perception that either now or before was better or worse, but I don't really believe that. I think there's, there's always generationally certain people who will run their own agencies who are looking to the future of the industry. Then there's a bunch of people who are going to be fantastic practitioners. And then there's a few people who potentially get lost uh, mm -hmm. and haven't really got a sense of why they want to be creative people. And I still find that uh, be, being the case. What I do find is there's um, a little bit of a disconnect between education and the reality of how design is applied now. I think the fundamentals of design um, are always the same, you know, how you look at the world, um, how you apply kind of critical thinking and how you communicate on behalf of whatever you're, you're communicating. But I think um, design is really an ecosystem now. It's interconnected and you can interact with it. And I think often students, when they come from uh, education into our studio, which is a 35, 40 person studio, so it's a relatively large studio, there's a bit of a disconnect there and they can be a little bit confused about how to apply their design training to the real world. And I think our job in that first kind of year, I suppose, is to not necessarily re-educate, but to enhance their education as they transfer from students to professional designers. Okay. So, so how, I mean, you, you've done a bit of teaching yourself, right? Yes. Yeah. 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 So tell us a little bit about, about, about that and your teaching experience. Okay. Uh, um, I've, I've done that a couple of times. I did it when I was very young. Mm. And if I'm honest, I was too young really to be teaching people. Mm. Mm. I didn't really have enough life experience. I think, I, I believe I, I've always been a good designer and I think I've always designed democratically for lots of people. And I think the methodologies I use are useful. But I think as, I, as I've got older and figured out the benefits of my experience, I think however I teach now has more value and validity. And what I, what I try to teach is the habits of being a good creative person and the habits of being a, a, a good designer um, and how you can become um, in a self, um, self-learning and continually adapting as a creative person. I think often people perceive a line in the sand. You come out of education and then each title you get is a line in the sand. So you're a junior designer, a designer, a senior designer, then you're a design director. And I don't th really think about it like that. I think about a set of habits and behaviors about how you look at the world, um, how you, you in yourself um, validate yourself as a creative person whilst doing something that's meaningful for millions of people. And I, I mentioned a second ago, we're very democratized. The work we design is for hundreds of millions of people. And that's how I see design. You have to think about the end user. You have to think about the audience you're designing for. So a lot of what I, I try to teach is the reality of designing for other people rather than yourself. I think it's, you have to be selfish as a creative, but I think you have to be fully aware of um, cultural shifts, social trends, and how people interact with the design now. It isn't how it used to be. And I think my job is to help people understand that. Fantastic. So you mentioned these habits. So what, what are the, these, the habits of a good designer? The secret recipe. <laughs> um, I think um, one of them is um, meeting real people. I think it's very easy to be v removed from the reality of who you're designing for. 
classically, you know, you can design a poster for somebody and let a few thousand people see it. But if you're d designing something that's on a digital platform or a phone, potentially billions of people are seeing that. And it's very easy for the end audience to, to become abstract and you think about yourself. So when I'm training younger designers, I try to get them to understand the reality of how people use the design. Um, I also think that um, you need to be bold when you're being creative. If you're going to create something interesting, you might as well push the envelope. So when we think about creativity, we think about a scale of one to 10, one being evolution and 10 being revolution. We operate on the five to 10 scale where we'd rather have a, a larger change. And that's how I see creativity. It, it, it improves things. It makes things better. So I try and instill that. And we have this sensibility of being always in beta. Um, even though I'm 30 years into my career, mm -hmm. I need to learn something today that I didn't know yesterday. Other, otherwise, I'm not growing and I'm not adapting to the world. And the world can outrun you if you, if you don't have that habit. So they're the, ten, the types of things I tended to, to look at. And then the craft. You know, you have to really look at detail. It's very easy to miss the detail of design. You have to love not perfection, but the beauty of what design does for people. So I think caring about what you do and caring about the people you work with is really important as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, um, how do you see, what would you say sort of to, to a designer that's really sort of looking into, into, into getting the career, into getting the degree? I, I, I would, initially I would say be selfish. It's very easy now with Dribbble and Behance and Instagram to look at all work that happens instantly. And it can be quite overwhelming for a creative person to figure out where you fit in the world. And it's very easy to look at what other people are doing and believe that's the right thing to do. And my feeling is if you're a creative person, it's self validating. You have to create the way you want to create. And there's lots of ways of doing that. I love lots of styles of design and creativity. So I think you've got to look at the thing that you really love, the things that you find meaningful and you care about, about your creative process and then find a studio, or a place to work or a client to work with that'll help facilitate that because often people forget that the relationship with the work you do and the client that you work with is they're the sponsor of you've been able to do great work and often i think the client and the way that you work with a client is a little bit abstract for students as well so i think that's a really important thing to think about if you're designing for yourself that's absolutely fine um if you're designing something which is very personal fine but we're commercial artists so we're designing for, for a lot of different people so i think it's important to remember that. Hmm. I mean, design education used to be uh, a nine to five, Monday to Friday uh, situation the, when, when we were trained. In school. Hmm. Uh, right now, in most courses around the world, you'd be lucky to get a day, a day and a half a week with a student. Yeah, exactly. So, so how would you address, what would be your recommendations uh, to address this, this challenge? Because, because it would be it was it was the way a designer was forged was of is in approaching their education like yeah. like like a job yeah, yeah exactly. right now the students have to juggle between uh working or you know other other commitments and also so the, the percentage of their education per week is, is, is very small yes so how how could we address this imbalance i think you have to use the time wisely so i think it's it's um it's about if you think about education as a whole, it's very unwieldy and it's very systemized and it's very traditional in the way that it uses time. Mm -hmm. so, so I believe little and often can be very effective. So I think what you have to do is slice the concepts down and slice the bigger drivers of the ideas down so that to make them more tangible. And I could imagine a, a time in the future where there's a lot more remote, small slices of very specific training rather than large systemized training because it'd be more meaningful for people. Uh, people work much more remotely, people, it's much more globalized now, and people use technology to uh, communicate and interact. Mm -hmm. So the way we're working now, if you were educating me one-to-one, um, -one, you could be doing that with a number of different people, but you could be doing small five, 10, 15 minute bursts about very insightful and meaningful things. I think sometimes so much is said and so much is taught and so much should feels like it should be taught, you actually get lost in it. And I think it's... Um, the clarity of the things that are most important, I think, is the thing I'd look at and look at the things that are currently missing from education that would improve people's chances of being a better designer mm -hmm. and having a better career. And it might mean that you have to sacrifice things we've held on for a long time because of habits. Oh. I think it's, there's time to maybe remove some of the things we've done traditionally and create new traditions. That's the thing I'd look at. Sure, sure. But, but do, you, do you find that 
how can a skill be cultivated, for example? You know, so is that yeah, skill again, the skill of the skill of the skill of looking, which is which is very the skill central, of looking, the, which is very essential yeah, yeah, to a course. designer, and it takes time to develop, and it takes certain uh, exercises or certain or certain approaches or certain commitment. How could we develop uh, strong skills in the students, and and still have that limited time frame? Because I I find that that there is no real time. To, to develop the skills. They don't, yeah. students yeah. don't realize the, the time commitment that- I understand you know, what for you're example, saying. For example, in, in 10, 12 hours of contact time, you know, they need to be spending four times that on, on their own. Yes, yeah. But since they're having to work, since they're having to do other, other commitments, I find the students are not able to so much cultivate the skill, but how could we help them to cultivate real, real skills that would, that would take them through a career that would last them for a long time, yes. rather than quick YouTube videos or quick fixes that some people are trying to do to, to respond that, to them. Um, that's why I talk about habits and behaviors and not skills. Mm -hmm. I think if you te teach people habits and behaviors, mm -hmm. they'll look at the world more critically and more creatively than if you teach them a specific skill. Skills come and go. When I think about employing someone in my studio, I think about their attitude and the way they look at the world creatively and what drives them as a human. I can teach any skill, but I can't teach looking at the world and, and their creative perspective. I, I just can't do that. You have to draw that out of people. And that's habits and behaviors. But I also think it's prioritization. I think we try to do too many things and people get overwhelmed. So I think you have to triage it and, and be very critical about what do you teach when? And I think some of the things we're teaching are just not relevant to the real world anymore. We have to sacrifice so them. So what would those things be? What would you add, replace or remove? That was very interesting. What, what, what is it that you well, would- I don't think there's enough understanding. Yeah. I don't, know if, I don't know if there's enough understanding of uh, the cultural shifts of what people require when you're designing for them on a, on a broad level. So, you know, understanding um, how people think, understanding socially what's happening, understanding culturally what's happening in the world is extremely beneficial to the design process. Whether you use a pencil or a computer or a piece of charcoal is academic. If you don't understand the, the reason you're designing and the meaning of it and how it's beneficial to the person that you're designing for, then it's pointless. Now, if you're doing a creative exercise to l learn typography, of course, you need to understand kerning and tracking and lots of different things. But if you took typography as an example, in the real world, the way we interact with typography now, it's not a fixed state. So teaching the traditional methods of hot metal press and how you typeset, it's useful. But the truth is, typography scales, it breaks, it changes, and it adapts how, with, with people using it. So you have to learn the engine that drives that as opposed to necessarily the specific small skills, because you add them on top of the methodology and theories that drive interconnected design systems. And I think sometimes we teach the little elements, but we're not teaching the things that drive the big ideas. So that's what we look at when we translate education and students into the real world. And it, not that I think there's anything necessarily broken. Um, I'm very positive about um, things at the moment. We see a lot of talent. We mm, see a lot mm, of people who are very talented mm, and mm. I speak to people like yourself very often. I, there's a lot of people who are thinking very critically about that. So I don't think there's a problem. I just think there's a great opportunity. Mm -hmm. So what are you looking at? What are you looking, sorry, what are you looking for in those portfolios? What, what is it that you want to see? If I was honest, I don't look at their work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So the, 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 the truth of it is when I interview, I, I very rarely interview early on because of mm -hmm. where I am in, in, in the kind of the company. Mm -hmm. But what I tend to do is speak to the person. I get an understanding from the person, how they see the world, what they care about. Uh, I often won't look at the university they've been. I won't look at their CV or their resume because I don't want to be, uh, my judgment to be clouded by where they went. What I want to figure out is what they learn. And what they learn is about how they carry themselves as a creative person, not a specific skill. Lots of people tell me what software they use. I don't care, I'm not interested. What I care about is what do you do with the software? Lots of people tell me about um, projects they did or briefs they did, and I think that's really interesting, but what was interesting to them about that brief? Excellent. And what was the problem that they overcame? But why did they overcome that problem? Who did they do that for? Those are the things I'm interested in, because if they understand that, the radical skills are really important things and the technologies they need to use to apply that to the industry. That's not too difficult to teach, but the, the habits and the caring and the hunger to be a great creative is, is very hard to teach, I think.
That's fantastic. That's fantastic. We always give the advice to students that you know sort of it's it's sort of exactly building that building that personality, building being able to be, be conversational yeah. about design, and be able and to I think talk what, about design. That's what great educators do as well. They mould people. They give them an opportunity to pull out talent that is nascent or they didn't know they had. Mm -hmm. And th mm -hmm. whenever I think about the lecturers who taught me, I went to a provincial college. Not a very good one, to be honest. And I started my first business when I was 19 as a reaction against feeling I wasn't learning. So I just went into the industry, which was either a really good idea or a really bad idea. <laughs> um, but we had one guy, a guy called Jim Dean, who was, um, he taught Swiss typography. And I remember the effect on me of learning about the power of Swiss typography and grids and the, and, and the beauty of that. But what I really remember is how passionate he was for that how much he cared about it, how much he valued it as an idea and a system. And that's what I took away from it. Not specifically, you know, a particular designer, though I was really into Wolfgang Weingart when I left college. That was the thing that most excited me, someone who knew the rules but broke them. But um, that sense of passion for it has always stayed with me, that, that kind of enthusiasm and drive. And I think if you can pull it out of people, they'll have a much better career than if they learn skills which might come and go. Absolutely brilliant. Well, tell us about the project you're working on right now. Working a lot of things. We, um, some of which I'm not allowed to talk about okay. because well, whatever um, you are allowed to talk about. So I'm buying time to think about what projects I'm allowed to talk about. We're doing a lot of work in the US at the moment. We're working with Audible, which is one of the Amazon brands. And that project's about um, onboarding and engaging um, their customers as they, as, they, as they meet the brand. And it's a really interesting challenge to figure out what's useful to those people and how it fits into their world and actually fits into their lifestyle and the way that they listen to content and how that makes them feel, the kind of the positive uplift and uh, uh, of learning something new and being able to share that with the world. And the design system has to go through a lot of rigor because it, it works on every single device and platform and it's, um, it's very immediate. So on a technical level, it's really interesting, but on an intellectual level, how learning um, and gaining knowledge and entertainment makes you feel better about yourself is really interesting about the project. Uh, we, we're doing quite a lot of um, sport work at the moment as well. So we're helping several sports clubs connect to their fans. And what's interesting about that is when you think about sport, it's kind of passion based. You wear it on your heart. You, if you have a football club you love. You can't get rid of that. You might get divorced. You might change your home. You might change your job, but you can't change your football club. So designing for people who care to that level, I think I find really exciting. I find that, really um it's a challenge because you have to do a good job and listening to them carefully is important but if you get it right it, it, it becomes so intrinsic to their life and that's what you want when you're designing i think to be part of someone's life and even if it's transient to you know at least made a little bit of a dis absolutely. difference absolutely yeah yeah fantastic so how can our viewers find you um dixonbaxi.com d-i-x-o-n-b-a-x-i.com is best place or at dixonbaxi Fantastic. So you mentioned some really, really, really valid points so far. Yeah. Uh, any, any, sort of, any kind of last advice you'd like to leave us with? The thing I always say is um, you have to create the way you, you create. So however you are educated, wherever you work, you have to think about the way that um, you make the work you do. And I think you shouldn't compromise on that. You shouldn't just work for money. You shouldn't just work for a title. You, you should look for work that makes you feel good about who you are. And you should stick to that because if you do, you'll have a really good career. And if you're good at doing that, you'll have an excellent career. So that's the thing I always think about. Absolutely brilliant, brilliant. Thank you so much, Simon. You're welcome. Uh, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you. Have a great, have a great, have a great week. Thank you.